Um, okay, so I'm going to give you a brief introduction to intrusive sexual and violent thoughts and uh, over the next 15, 20 minutes. And then we're going to have a conversation with Rose and then open it up, please, to your own experiences. Because we're going to try and focus on the practical things about what you can do, what might be helpful and what's not helpful. And th think about some of the controversial aspects to it as well. Okay? So... Um, so what, what we're going to be talking about intrusions today, and these are intrusive thoughts, images, doubts, sensations, urges, and it could be about something that's happened in the past, it could be happening right now, or it could be in the future. And we're mainly going to focus on sexual ones and the sort of violent sexual things, uh, but also, of course, these relate to uh, thoughts and intrusions about relationships or blasphemous things. They're all the same rubbish. And uh, the content, <laughs> the content doesn't really matter. You know, it's the form, the, relate, the, the process behind them that matters. And of course, by definition, they're inconsistent with your values. And um, you're always, you know, your OCD will then start to question, well, do I really like it? You know, so of course it's not, you know, these things but are, the OCD grabs onto these things as well. Um, they're not in your control, that's why they're called intrusions. And um, you also have thoughts about these thoughts. So, you know, are they really in, under my control? Maybe I could, could and so on. Um, and they're often misunderstood by professionals. And I'm really sorry if you've met a professional who has started to instigate safeguarding or started to all sorts of nonsense, which is either because of their own stupidity or usually because of uh, covering their own back. Yeah? I'm afraid everybody's bullied these days by all sorts of things, and I'm afraid health professionals are bullied as well by their own managers and by legislation and so on. Um, and uh, I find it certainly is an intelligence problem. The people who are the most intelligent are the people who have the worst problems of this type of OCD, because, of course, thinking, analysing, and so on. If, you know, one treatment might be to actually make you more stupid, and uh, it would probably solve a lot of these problems. Right, and I want to say particularly something about images. Now, I could just say that, you know, I'm having thoughts about a, you know, a, a, a wrinkled hand or something, but actually an image is so much more powerful than thoughts. We know that the images are much more vivid and much more probably likely to be more scary in many ways. So images are definitely more difficult. And the other thing... I... <laughs> I had the most strange conversations <laughs> about groinal sensations, yeah? And I can see you're all sort of smiling at this at the moment. Uh, it is, yes, it's a favorite topic, isn't it? Um, so just to say, look, if you're having groinal sensations, <laughs> these are normal, okay? They're, it's not full arousal, and it's often a mix of anxiety. Uh, it's an automatic reflex reaction. It's not in your control. Um, it's where your threat system turns your attention towards the normal sensations. And the effect, of course, of this is to magnify your awareness of the sensation. So it really cranks it up, and you're really aware of it, and it just becomes the full focus of your attention. Um, and it's really difficult, of course, to refocus your attention away from these groinal sensations and go against that threat system, yeah? But, you know, just again, they are normal, they're not in your control, and it's not full arousal. And the key thing, of course, in OCD is that they have a different meaning. Uh, you might, therefore, think that because I'm having these particular images or thoughts, I'm going to act upon them that the thoughts by themselves could cause harm. It's immoral to have these thoughts. It's the same as doing it. I must really secretly want it. It foretells the future in some way. I might transfer them onto objects. You know, these are the common meanings and processes that occur with intrusive thoughts and images. These are the things to have a good understanding about what's going on rather than the content of the actual thought. And the key issue is going to be how you respond to these thoughts and images. So 
there are lots of different ways, aren't there? So in your head alone, it might be trying to avoid them, suppress them, distract yourself from them, think nice things, or switch off from them, yeah? Or it could try to undo them, and there are all sorts of very sophisticated mental washing that goes on in people's heads. Or try and transform it into a different image. Uh, trying to verify, check my memory whether it's true, mentally review whether I abused a child, check whether I like a sensation, check by putting images in my mind to see if I'd enjoy it. So these are the common types of checking types of routines. Or trying to rationalize and reassure myself it's not real, you know, work out whether I really am a paedophile or homosexual or whatever it is. Uh, try and convince myself that I'm not bad. And of course you'll know that it doesn't solve the problem, it just makes it worse, it just feeds it. Yeah? Um, you so, I know you all know that probably intellectually, but it's very difficult not to do it. And then there will be all sorts of other things in the real world, not just in your head, in terms of avoiding triggers like, let's say, being alone with children if you fear being a paedophile, or avoiding going anywhere who might be gay, in case you might become gay, uh, using alcohol, substances, making confessions to others, discussing, seeking reassurance from others, checking by watching gay porn or something or child porn to see whether you might get aroused, uh, trying to decontaminate yourself, wash yourself. These are all the common ways of, of responding. Um, so the first thing to say, of course, is that intrusions are normal. And you've probably heard this many times, but I think it's just worth saying again. Surveys have shown that people with OCD are just as likely to have these senseless thoughts. They're more frequent in people with OCD and distressing, but they're just the same in terms of content. But in people without OCD, they just pass through. They're not really noticed or they're not associated with any distress. And they don't view themselves as being bad or immoral to have such thoughts. Oh, right. So the key thing I want to try and focus on today is to try and be aware of rabbit holes. Yeah, rabbit holes. So you all know what rabbit holes are like. And if you sort of put, your, if you're a dog and put your nose around a rabbit hole, they look very interesting. <laughs> And you sort of look around, and, but the problem being, of course, if you go down these rabbit holes, you get very dark and horrible, and you get stuck. And the further and further you go down them, the more difficult it is to get out of them. So the key thing I'm going to want to try and focus you on is to spot the rabbit holes, because and actually pay full attention to the world as it is, not, of course, how, according to how you feel. And you can either choose to go down that rabbit hole and see what effect it has in terms of making you worse, or stay on the track and do the things in life which are important to you despite the way you feel and despite all those rabbit holes which are inviting you to go down and to analyze and ruminate in various ways. So what doesn't help? Well, I think sort of some of you, you've already heard about some of the ways you might be responding. Certainly discussing with yourself or others about the intrusions. So beware of therapists who want to endlessly talk about the content, yeah? And what it really means and so on and so on. So as I'm saying, in general, you can deal with the content and have an assessment quite quickly because, as I said, they're all rubbish. Um, Trying to find an answer to why. You know, this again is another different type of rumination. And why have I got these things? And if only I didn't have them, and so on and so on. These are a more depressive type ruminations. Or being self critical for having them, again, is another depressive type rumination. Um, or telling yourself what you should have felt with this particular intrusion, and so on. So these are all more rabbit holes to go down. I think the best way perhaps I'd usually like to think of these things are the intrusions are like cars in the traffic. Yeah? So imagine that those, the ones that you don't want are the red cars and at the moment you are going into the road, wandering into the road trying to stop those cars or get into the car, divert them down another route or park them, sort them out. And so you spend your whole life in your head you know, trying to sort out the traffic. Instead, of course, what we want you to be able to do is to uh, be able to walk down the side of the road, do the things in life which are important to you, despite the traffic, because, of course, you can never control and stop the traffic. Yeah? And try to always distance yourself, walk along the side of the road, be aware of the passing traffic, 
but don't try to control it. That's the, the most important message. You know, you can never get rid of the traffic. Only white walkers and zombies don't have thoughts, yes? Or, you know, you'll, you won't have thoughts when you're dead or things like that. You'll always have, have intrusions. Don't, you know, just give up trying to avoid them or control them. Just get focused on life. And the, I suppose the, <laughs> the key message of these intrusions, actually, in response, is actually do nothing with them. Just leave them alone. <laughs> they do not want to be solved. They are non-problems. Yes, and say nothing in response because you know people endlessly want to debate with them or seek rationalise with them or reassure themselves about them or get more information, retrieve memory from them, mentally check about them. Say nothing. Do nothing, say nothing. <laughs> um, and of course, there's always lots of room for exposure behavior experiments to test out your expectations and learn to tolerate the distress. So, you know, do not avoid having a sexual relationship because you're OCD, even if the images pop into your head when you're having sex. Again, this is normal. Um, you know, go to that gay club if you believe that you fear that you're homosexual and something bad could happen. You know, don't go to it if you're going to check. It's always got to sort out exactly what the function is. Um, have a knife in the back pocket whenever you want to hand so you've got the opportunity to stab your relative loved one when you're getting those urges. So always try to, you know, go over the top and allow yourself to have those, those opportunities. Deliberately transfer the intrusive thoughts onto the ground if that's important. You know, draw, paint them. You have to be very creative, I think, in terms of trying to uh, externalize these images and what they mean to you. Now, this is something I just want to finish on in terms of actually controversy. Because um, certainly, I've heard from some people with OCD where they find it helpful to make it worse, uh, like a cartoon, so you can laugh at it. Um, but you've got to be careful that it's not there to function as a way of neutralizing it in some way. And I'd like to hear from people later on in terms of what they find helpful or not helpful. Um, I've also heard work from a lot of people who've been to therapists, usually in the States and things, but or certain very focused on encouraging exposure and imagination to their worst fears. And I'm not so sure about this. Um, you know, let's suppose you've got those paedophile images, do you really need to do the exposure to the images and actually imagine it, making it worse, all the way up to being sent to jail? I'm not sure, and we haven't got evidence in terms of what's the best way of dealing with things. You know, we know that exposure and all these ex and experiments are best for doing things in the out external world, but we don't know about exposure and imagination, yeah? how effective it is, and whether it's helpful for this, these type of things. Yeah? So I'm just being honest and saying that there is uh, uncertainty out there in terms of how best, in terms of the role of exposure in imagination. Um, and, you know, just like Paul, I'm very keen to do further research in this area, and I'm very happy, very keen uh, to kind of send something around later on. If you're very, if you've got particularly intrusive sexual thoughts about paedophilia and so on, please do let me know. And you're, if you're willing to be contacted in the future, potential research, just questionnaires and surveys and so on, because we do need to understand more about this and exactly what is different about them with paedophiles and things like that, because. As always, the better understanding we've got of these things, the better treatments we can try to develop. Okay? So, we're going to have a conversation now. <laughs> and, um, and again, we haven't had any... Uh, this could go horribly wrong. It could. <laughs> um, you want to click on there. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah. I'm on. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, Rose, um, what do you think? You've, you've had a lot of experience now. Mm -hmm. What do you think is helpful or not helpful in dealing with these intrusions? Um, well, helpful in the very first instance was actually finding out that I had OCD. Um, and that I had never committed a paedophilic, paedophilic act and that um, I wasn't suppressing my sexuality and that um, 
I didn't want to do all the terrible things to my body that I was thinking about in my mind and knowing that those intrusions um, were a part of something else um, and that they didn't come from some place deep down inside me because that's what I'd thought for um, a good seven years. So just um, at a, a very basic level, that understanding. Good information. Good information. Good education. And... Um, most of what I did for the first decade of, I mean, I say the first decade, I think I've always had OCD, and the older I get, the more I realise how far back into my childhood it, it went, but the, from when it exploded, when I was 15 years old with intrusive thoughts that I uh, was a paedophile and that I, I could or had harmed a child, for the first 10 years after that, pretty much everything I did was unhelpful. Um, so, um, the, the biggest sort of, uh, bucket of compulsions that I did initially was, uh, searching my memories because the OCD had been triggered by memories, which I now understand to have been, uh, very innocuous, natural, normal sexual development as a child, sexual play, sexual play, you know, kiss chase, uh, uh, boy, you know, whatever, uh, kiss the bride and all this kind of stuff, um, which when I hit puberty, I suddenly had this rush of memories of like, oh my God, did I abuse a child? Am I a paedophile? So that was followed by a couple of years of intensely trawling my memories, trying to figure out whether or not um, what was real, what I'd done, what was real, what it meant about me. Um, and I was doing my GCSEs at the time and uh, I was having 24-7 intrusive sexual thoughts about paedophilia and it was horrific. Um, and uh, I was also having intrusive, th more general intrusive thoughts about my sexuality, um, general sexual intrusions about both men and women, um, what did they mean, um, did, because at that point I'd only ever fancied boys but then you know maybe because I was having these thoughts maybe that meant I need to reconsider maybe um, I, it meant that I couldn't have relationships with men when I was older yada yada all this rumination and soul searching um, and it was really disastrous it sort of uh, kind of destroyed most of my youth that process of soul searching and then more unhelpful was when I finally did go to the doctors um, and um, no one picked up on the fact that I had OCD um, and I was asked whether I'd been abused as a child. I was asked whether I thought I was suppressing my sexuality. Um, I was given extremely powerful antidepressants when I was 18, which made me self-harm. Um, I was given psychodynamic therapy, which got me to try and explore my past to try and figure out where these thoughts might have come from. And by this point, I'm in my mid-20s and I haven't really had... Uh, an adult life yet because I've been so unwell um, and in terms of what started to be use useful was um, learning about um, about a better way about CBT and ERP exposure and response prevention therapy and finally getting myself a course of that um, so, so, so what, what did it involve in terms of the exposure aspects? Mm -hmm. So by that point something funny happened in my late teens in that my OCD theme like the the, the paedophilia theme just went away almost overnight as quickly as it had come. Um, and, but what I was left with was more general sexual intrusions that made me doubt my sexuality. And um, so by, that was the focus of my exposure therapy. Um, and it was, I don't, I don't want to say hierarchy because it wasn't sort of fixed. We kind of recalibrated it week on week. But I was um, exposed to most of my in, intrusions were visual. So I was exposed to um, visual materials of a sort of gradually more explicit nature. Or not, sometimes not even explicit. So, so it wasn't in your imagination, it was of... Uh, no, but I was, and it's funny you mentioned America, because I, I had therapy with an American clinician, and they did encourage that kind of imaginative self-exposure as well. Uh, they're very, their techniques are very aggressive in the US, they're like go hard or go home mm. um, and it's that, that I, f I actually found that really challenging and I, yeah. I do wonder whether actually that was perhaps re-traumatising rather than soothing. Well that's one of my concerns. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but actually, saying that, I also received that kind of treatment in the UK as well with yeah. uh, what they what they call flooding, which was uh, an intensive exposure therapy course, which I actually do think was was very traumatizing. Um, you know, right right but, out of scenario again, of your worst was nightmare. Mainly, was it mainly in your imagination or more external things? Uh, both, but the imagination stuff was like right out a scenario of your worst nightmare, and you know, read it 15 times a day. And I still don't really know on which side of, like, where, what's the best approach. And mm. by the sounds of it, there's no research to suggest either way. But, mm. um, so the ERP was, the ERP was really helpful in just kind of taking the edge off the thoughts, you know, just um, to sort of learn when you're acting out compulsions. And, like, even though I still, I would still say I have OCD, the C part now for me is very, very minimal. Um, and what I'm left with is continuing intrusive thoughts, I think, because it's so deep-rooted. It was over so many years, like, and maybe I think this is a question for you, David, like how, um, you know, you can, you can understand on an intellectual level that there's, uh, there's no content to the thoughts, but, you know, we're not just minds, we're bodies too. And the anxiety for me has always been extremely bodily. I feel it here in my chest and here in my throat. Mm. And it's actually my body that wired and made that connection between sexual content and anxiety. And I'm still left with that, those, that automatic response. And I don't know how to rewire that with, with CBT and ERP alone. It hasn't mm. been able to do that up to this point because it feels too deep. It feels like it's, in, it's a bodily trauma because of mm -hmm. what I went through so young. Um, so, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, well, I don't think we, we don't want to get too revealing. Okay. Well, I don't know. Because <laughs> you're saying that there were past experiences mm -hmm. that were particularly aversive. Uh, so when, I, when I'm talking about trauma, I'm talking about the trauma of experiencing such intense anxiety as a result of my OCD when I was 14, 15 years old. Okay. And that the anxiety in my body became quite... Sorry, it's my phone. Um, the anxiety in my body became just very deeply rooted and it feels like it's still there. So I, I know intellectually... So, so, so the memory of it, it still keeps coming back like a traumatic memory? I think so. I think so. Um, yeah. Hmm. That, that there's an automatic connection still between triggers and anxiety. And even though there's my, my brain is an interface and knows, oh, well, you know... I know that these are just intrusive thoughts and that I have OCD, like I, I still feel a bodily anxiety that, that feels like it's harder to uproot. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes that those sorts of old experiences do need to be emotionally processed. Mm. And the problem is, is that a bit like an old trauma, they sort of keep coming back all the time. Uh, in, like as if supposing you were visiting a road traffic accident or uh, being assaulted in some way, that memory still keeps, feels, or has a sense of nowness about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in therapy it can be helpful to revisit these memories mm -hmm. and help to put them back in the right place, as it were, mm -hmm. to be able to provide your younger self with what it is that she needed at the time. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? <laughs> well... <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't get into that. <laughs> All right, well... Yeah, no, no, no there, the there are approaches do. called imagery rescripting or sometimes EMDR. EM, yeah, I've like read that. about EMDR. That's the... Yeah. the Eye movement desensitization reprocessing. It overlaps very much with some work we've done on imagery rescripting, but the point is, is that uh, sometimes... It, it's more often used in OCD for things like bullying and like betrayal, it, events that seem to be important in the development of a person's mm -hmm. OCD. Mm -hmm. Um, so for some people it can be very helpful to be mm. able to help you to emotionally reprocess mm. that event yeah. in the same way that you, if you've got PTSD or something like mm. that but it does mean re-experiencing going back to that time when you were a child adolescent experiencing, re-experiencing and trying to provide the child with what it is that she needs mm. yeah um, on a lighter note <laughs> Uh, and what you what you asked me in terms of what I found helpful and not helpful, um, helpful exposure therapy very helpful. And also, what I found extremely helpful after that was discovering uh, mindful practice, which actually what you described there, do nothing. You're essentially describing yeah. mindfulness. But it's bloody difficult. It's extremely difficult. <laughs> so we've got to be careful that mindfulness is not you know a treatment. 
but it may be something that may be helpful mm -hmm. later on, yeah, later particularly on. in terms of trying to develop a different relationship with your intrusions. Mm -hmm. But when you're highly anxious and panicky, you cannot be uh, mindful. Yeah. It's very difficult. Uh, to give you an example, I, um, a couple of summers ago, I did a 10-day silent meditation retreat, insight meditation, which is Vipassana mindfulness. And um, Drive me around the bend, that. <laughs> well, it did for the first three days. Actually, it ended up being so beneficial, yeah. um, so profound. Uh, but had I done that in the depths of my OCD before I'd done um, yeah. exposure therapy, I think it would have sent me crazy. Yeah. You know, so it, I feel like there's layers of treatment. Yeah. Um, and it, it's kind of an ongoing journey that I'm still on. Mm. Well, I think one of the key things in mindfulness, there's lots of good things about it, is learning to distance yourself and not to be fused with it, not engage with it, just mm. to notice with non-judgmental way. Yeah. So these yeah. are all important aspects, but it's very difficult to do, as you say, when you're highly anxious. Yeah. Mm. Shall we throw it out? Yeah. To the audience. Let's and see what other people can contribute. I'd really like to focus on um, what helps and what doesn't help, yeah? Can we, I, sorry, yeah, go, on. go on. I was just gonna say, I, when you were speaking, I was jotting down questions as well. Can I start with the question? Sure. Um, <laughs> I, so, I think, and probably people in the audience will understand this frustration. Uh, one thing as a sufferer of OCD that can get tricky is that you, obviously different clinicians will have different emphases and different ideas about what works so mm. you could go to someone will, and will say you need to do it this way and go to someone and say you need to do it that yeah. way and I um, am you know obviously very I'm connected in the space I've had a lot of opportunity to speak to a, a lot of amazing people and I'm still confused <laughs> um, and I, one, one thing that I'm particularly confused about is the is what level of reassurance is acceptable because I, w I did my hardball American um, exposure therapy and they were like you know what you've just got a when you have an intrusive thought about a naked woman you've got to be like yeah maybe I'm gay maybe I'm gay and there's no like it's just got to be like really mm. like and I was never able I, you know at an intellectual level I was able to always understand why I was being told to do that but mm. at a visceral level I was never able to accept that that could be the case yeah so, yeah. you so, know, uh, or with gro groinal response, for example, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Am, I allowed to rem am I allowed to be like, oh, yeah, that's groinal response, or do I have to be yeah. like, I'm really turned on right now? Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the key thing, as you already said, is do nothing, say nothing. Mm -hmm. But um, in preparation for that, it is important to develop a different relationship with yourself in terms of providing emotional support. So this is something that we're talking a little bit about this morning. In terms of, it's not this, it's not reassurance, but it's it, it's saying to Rose, look, I understand this is tough. Um, I know it's going to be causing anxiety, but it's trying to keep you safe. So it's you know it, it's the tone of the voice that's terribly important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms of being compassionate and caring. So it's, it's providing emotional support, but it's not providing bland reassurance. Mm -hmm. Or if you've got someone who's close to you, it's about seeking out, not, not wanting to discuss the content of it or what's happening, but just saying, I need a hug, or Let's, can we go for a walk, or can I have a cup of tea, or whatever it is. So you're getting emotional support, mm -hmm. but you're not getting involved in the content of the rubbish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you're a bit, you, you still got doubts. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. There isn't one answer, that's the problem, isn't it? That's what people with OCD struggle with. <laughs> I've given you one answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, look, it's really tough. I'm just saying the principle is more not getting involved in the content, that's right. And I, I'm not convinced myself that, that responding in the way that you described mm -hmm. in terms of making it worse, isn't it? And yeah, tough, yeah, yeah, you, exactly, maybe you are yeah. gay. The aggressive approach. I mean, it, it breaks the first rule that you're responding to it. Yeah. Yeah? We're saying do nothing, say nothing, mm -hmm. but trying to develop a different relationship with yourself that provides emotional support. Yeah. Because this is really tough. And you, the whole thing about um, compassion is about being able to reach out and connect. Mm -hmm. So it's connecting with others mm -hmm. and connecting with yourself. Mm -hmm. So you do have to develop, you know, the best friend in your life is going to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't rely on others. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That's good to hear. I think I think I think compassion and self kindness is the one thing that was almost completely absent from the CBT and ERP that I received, yeah. and I think I really needed that. Yeah, and it's a difficult skill. <laughs> okay, um, we've got some roving microphones. So it says that keep focused on what helps and what doesn't help. Hello. Um, so I was just wondering about so what Rosa was talking about in terms of um, kind of you got, you've got rid of the compulsion element, but you've gone the obsession. You've still got the intrusive thoughts, and then you've got the anxiety. In terms of like, I'm thinking about the um, OCD like um, cycle of doing uh, the obs having the intrusive thought, getting anxiety, going um, having the compulsion and anxiety back again. You've kind of got rid of that the compulsive half of that, but obviously you're still getting the. Uh, entries of thought and anxiety. I'm just wondering if there's something about accepting that you're going to feel anxious about things, whether that is in some ways helpful, because, well, yeah, that, that would make sense to me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, think, I think the stage that I'm at now with, with my condition is exactly that. Um, I'm just dealing, you know, I've whittled down my compulsive behaviour. I mean, I'm, st I'm still ruminate, ruminating, to be fair, like I haven't completely extinguished that. But, um, you know, as David and I were talking about, this has been 15 years of my life that where those connections have been forged in my mind and I'm still dealing with the, the physical symptoms of that and it's quite painful and I don't want it. And I think I just have to let, give myself space to actually feel those things in an accepting and loving and non-judgmental way. And that might take many, many more years. It might never be gone because, it, you know, it runs deep. Yeah, because I think kind of pushing away that, that anxiety actually makes it worse. In a lot exactly. Of ways. Whereas exactly. just accepting it is probably, yeah. Well, Thank it's, you. It's what we call emotional reasoning, because you okay. feel anxious, there therefore must be a threat, yeah? So you're using anxiety as evidence that there is a threat and danger. Yeah. Remember, um, there's people at the back as well. Who's, who's, someone else needs to take another. Yeah. I've got one here. you got one? Great, sorry. Go for it. Uh, I just like to thank you, Rose, because you've really inspired me to like. First of all, like the first time I've resonated with anyone um, in terms of like reading articles and stuff, because the same as I've heard a few times today. Like I also thought that OCD was the hand washing, like oven check and disease. So it's been um, really helpful. What I find quite confusing is, like you said, the, the very different. To, like pieces of advice because some things I find help to begin with but then start not to help anymore and I'm also at a stage where I've accepted OCD and intellectually can understand it but I I only struggle with it mentally as well like not f like physical compulsions as much that are overt but I was going to say that I do find it helpful to just say maybe yes maybe no to every question that comes up now because I spent so long engaging with it and whether that's thinking I'm being kind to myself through proving that I'm a good person and answering the <laughs> questions, but it yeah. always, OCD always won and found a reason why I was bad. So yeah. I do so think if you've got kind of more of a like mental... So this would be an approach to try and help you to tolerate the doubts. You're mm. encouraging the doubts. Mm -hmm. As I said, we don't have good evidence um, in terms of big trials that compare, that say somebody going down the route of tolerating just the doubts mm. and just maybe yes, maybe no. We don't have another group that might be, um, you know, doing full exposure in the way I described and, and so on, or someone trying to do nothing in response. And it may be that for some people, one approach might be works better than another. But for me, the fact that you're still getting those intrusive thoughts, you know, it, there's something going on with maybe yes, maybe no. It mm. might still be keeping it going. But, I don't know. Yeah, but th th what's better about it is is that it doesn't cause me as much anxiety. Right. And I don't think it's true that you can do absolutely nothing because I think yep. that you're going to get some sort of dialogue, even if that's you like, using your awareness to watch the two yeah. voices. It's, you're, there's something going to... So you're whether saying that's, it's, it's pretty impossible. To sit with uncertainty, I think, is the most important thing for yeah. us because that's what we struggle with. Yeah. So, no, yeah. I, I fully agree. And I was also going to add in that I think mindfulness and meditation can be hugely beneficial after those first few stages of acknowledging what, that you've got OCD and that you're not bad. And then the kindness, I think, can come from yep. breathing techniques and mindfulness. So, so tolerating uncertainty, Rose? Um, 
Yeah, it's funny because uh, that maybe no, maybe yes response was exactly what I was told to do in therapy. Um, sort of em embracing the literal doubt of I don't know who I I don't know who I am I know, and I can't find an answer. Um, and I don't... It's frustrating, but I don't know if that made me worse or made me better. I don't know. Mm. Let's, let's do a show of hands. <laughs> <laughs> who thinks that tolerating the doubt in terms of responding to maybe yes, maybe no... <laughs> might be helpful in terms of in the long term okay and who thinks it doesn't yeah but equal mm. yeah that's interesting i don't think anything will solve you no. you're never going to really know any no, of the I answers know. and yeah. and i think we're quite impressionable and our um intuition is quite low down because of all, all the noise and chaos that's going on so maybe just acceptance is yeah okay. thank you yeah I, I suppose there's a slight difference when I wanted to emphasize the emphasis between responding maybe, yes, maybe not, as opposed to actually just assuming that as a doubt. Do, do you see what I mean? No, in other words, that we talk about it now and it fully accept that maybe, yes, maybe not, but in the moment, not saying those things. I, mean, I say them in my head and it's the only thing that's worked so far, like to ease it a bit, so I'm not sure. Yeah. But th th I think there's a difference between in the moment as opposed to talking about it, maybe yes, maybe not, later at some other stage. Do you have OCD? Do I have OCD? I don't have OCD, thank God. <laughs> Go for it, yeah. Hello, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just going to share um, just something, two things that helped um, and one thing that really didn't, if, if that's all right. Mm. Um, so my uh, intrusive thoughts caused me to hate myself on a level that I don't think, um, well, it definitely wasn't healthy um, and it didn't help anybody. It made me want to want to die, really. Um, and one thing that I found really helped, which my CBT therapist taught me, and this is such a nuanced thing, but it might resonate with someone, um, I would go to him and I would say, before I was diagnosed with OCD, how did I manage to do this? Like, how did I manage to do a degree or have this job or whatever? Because I was just completely in, in that mindset. I felt like I couldn't do anything. I just wanted to be dead. Like, sorry to be really depressing. Um, and he taught me this thing where you remove the how and you just say, I did this and I did that. And instead of saying how, you're not doubting it. You're just saying, this is what I did and accepting it. Um, so that was one thing that really helped. I don't know. Okay. So just reminding yourself of actually what you have done, who you are. Yeah. Um, because sorry. Um, because I would constantly, um, it would make the intrusive thought would make me doubt myself, doubt everything I've done, make me think I was awful and had done um, awful things, and I would be like, how and how this, how that, and just to kind of remove mm -hmm. that how. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other thing that I found, which I always hated people saying this, but is exercise um, hugely helped me. Um, when you're doing exercise, you, it, you struggle to have intrusive thoughts because you're just thinking, my God, I'm so unfit. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like you're just focusing on trying to breathe if you're like on a run. Um, and that, that really, really helped. Um, so yeah, just two little that's, things. That's really helpful. Thank you. What do you? Um, I was just, it just occurred to me that maybe one way of thinking about um, what's helpful and what isn't and in terms of the things that people find helpful at different stages, you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs where he's, um, I don't know, you'll know better than me, but there's like, uh, you know, basic needs like air, food and water, and then you have shelter, and then the more luxurious stuff like friends and family and community, and then there's like stuff. So maybe think about your treatment like that, like like crisis intervention um, might involve medication or might involve um, seeing a crisis therapist, then you might, you know, a, a, a months long course of exposure therapy. And then we, and then you can start talking about things, other things that are really helpful like meditation and exercise and diet and not drinking too much, not taking drugs, which is all so, so helpful. But I take this lady's point, you know, sometimes if you're in the depth of it and someone says, why don't you go and do a spin class? You might, you feel like- You, you just want to tell like, them to I think I'm going to move past that. But, uh, but no, but totally like it, 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 it all that stuff matters. Yes, thank you very much, both of you. 
Um, I'm just wondering, David, you mentioned EMDR, and I'm wondering how CBT, but in particular EMDR, could help with the sensations, the visceral sensations that Rose is describing. How, how would that work, and how could it well, I'm help I'm saying that um, if you have past aversive memories, particularly with imagery and bodily sensations, sometimes in OC and other disorders, it can be helpful to go back to some of those early experiences using imagery scripting, or other colleagues have told me EMDR, because they overlap quite a lot, and try to help you to emotionally process that memory and help you to provide the younger self with what it is that he or she needs. It, it's a, a technique that's used by therapists. Is it available on the NHS, EMDR? Yeah, it? well, it depends upon who you see. Thank you. But we have written about it and using it in, in OCD as well in a case series with myself and Paul Sarkoskis. Hello there. I'm Matt. Um, I don't know, am I the first guy who spoke? I mean, the one, the one thing I would say is with sexual violent intrusive thoughts, for many years I thought, well, this is just going to be guys because I think... And, and it's sad to hear that women suffer with it, but I just seem to naively think, well, you know, it's a guy thing, you're going to feel perverted, you're going to feel this, and especially the paedophilia film, uh, theme thing, I thought, well, no, only guys are think that, you know, you only hear of paedophiles being guys, but it just shows you how it doesn't discriminate anyone, mm -hmm. but um, I mean, I, I went from eight years old, I had lots of different themes of checking, um, I can remember like washing and loads of things, but when I was 18, I become a dad at quite a young age, and um, I, I got my little baby boy who I loved home from hospital and I had this fault and I thought what the worst thing it could be, ever be is that I'll be a paedophile and uh, I'm 42 this year and uh, it still hurts me, it still hurts me to say it, my stomach like knots mm. and that and uh, I think I've got to the stage, I, you know, I know that going jogging, I know that eating healthy, I know that awareness severe, I've, I've had CBT three times although ERP was never mentioned which is a bit of a shame. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I know lots of things. I even present a radio show now um, called Mind Over Matter, and I talk about um, mental health. But I still I feel like I've got to a certain stage, but when it kicks in, it's still as fresh as when I was 18 years old. And I was over the park last week and took my lovely five-year-old daughter, and I've got a two-year-old son as well. Um, so I've always exposed myself, as in, mm -hmm. that sounds terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> Yes, uh, I said I said this I said this on uh, the radio as well, and my wife yeah yeah probably not the best thing to say I said this on the radio show with my wife on there, but uh, yeah I've, I've, exposure's not been a, a problem for me as in you know I've got kids I, I wash them I bathe them you know you kind of do all that stuff, but it's that still that questioning thing, and even after all these years I will still get to the stage where I go to myself like we was over the park the other week and my father was there who's seventy and he was uh, making making some kids laugh and you know he, they was all surrounding him and I looked at him and I thought oh, wouldn't, that will never be me I will always have this intrusive thought pop up, I will always have this kick in the stomach, this thing that holds me back going you're not good enough, you're not a good enough person and you know it's uh, yeah so it's two sides to it, in lots of ways I'm not as lonely I know that women and men suffer with it but I'm also like you know when is there hope for me you know are them neural pathways too ingrained I don't I don't know. I hope there's hope, but I tell everyone else there's hope. But when things like that happen, I think, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. One more comment down there. Come on. Um, I was just um, going to say something about EMDR because it's something that I found really difficult. Um, because I, when I, I've only recently got like the right, seen the right therapist and got ERP and stuff. Um, and we've also done a bit of EMDR relating to the sort of trauma of having OCD, like what you're explaining, Rose, of like that, the feelings are still there and you still get, not necessarily the, um, it's not in like the here and now, the doubt, it's more like, oh, that happened in the past and it keeps like coming back. And something I found really helpful was EMDR and also doing, Imagine all imaginal exposure with the MDR to kind of process the trauma of having had those doubts and uncertainties in my head. So that's just something I found helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and also I think just finding the right treatment at the right stage. So like 
you know, sometimes you might need the crisis team, sometimes you might need ERP, then you might need to do some mindfulness. I think that's something I found helpful is not being rigid and saying, I have OCD and therefore I just need to do this one thing at this particular time as being quite flexible and that's, that I found that really helpful. Okay, thank you. Have we got time for a couple more? Have you got one, one more question? One more? We've got three minutes. Three minutes, yeah. Should we have a couple of quick, 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 quick things? got one here. Anyone at the back? Yeah. Hi. Is yep. Go yeah? for it. I was just going to say, um, in terms of things that are helpful, um, I find nature really, really helpful. Um, uh, it, I'm definitely at a stage where um, I'm still kind of working out <laughs> um, what's going to help. Um, but just, um, I moved recently, actually, and I've moved to the countryside and I can, I look over a field and I can climb over the fence and I can walk through the field. And if I walk through the field, I don't know, I just feel just, maybe it's that distance thing. It's just, it just calms me um, a little bit and just kind of takes the edge off. And I've also found that having that kind of quick access, because where I used to live before, I kind of had to get in the car before I could go somewhere quieter and with nature and then they're all issues around fears of being in the car and fears of leaving my home but now because like I look out over it it's really close and it's like my kind of when things are really uh, I'm just looking around the house and all I can see is things that don't feel right and all I can see is my little cats and I'm worrying about them dying the field is just there and if I can get to the field I just have that little moment where yeah. I'm just really proud I got to the field. <coughs> and I said, just get to the field. <laughs> so right. although moving was like <laughs> one of the hardest things to ever do, um, yeah, it, that's okay. been really good. So it's probably something about keeping focusing your attention more externally and actually what's happening around you rather than what's happening in your mind. Because, yeah. you know, living in your head and being focused in your head, and I often see people in crises when their eyes are closed and they're trying to sort things out in the head, that is absolutely disastrous. So you, you know, <laughs> Living in your head is dangerous. Yeah, definitely. And having, I think the thing for me is that I've, I've, I've now kind of got quicker access to outside my head. Yeah. I had to, because I used to live in a really busy area, um, and I just used to, there were all those cars going past outside, yeah. drawing my attention, and it felt like being in my head, whereas that field is quite different to my head, and I can get there really quickly yeah, yeah. and easily. So it's kind of become my little, like... I'm going in the field. <laughs> yeah, that's great. If we've got time for one more, just there. Hi, yeah. Hi. Um, it's just actually a question for Rose, actually. Um, I have heard a lot about meditation and mindfulness. I can't see you. Can you give me a oh, wave? Oh, sorry. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, I've heard a lot about um, meditation and mindfulness, like being really helpful um, for like mental health. Um, but I was just wondering, like, how how have you, which of you, how have you found it, like, to be beneficial for you? Um, and like how much of it would you recommend people do? Like? I mean, f for me, it's just useful for everything. I don't think there's anything mystical about mindfulness. What we mean when we say mindfulness is sitting and observing your sensory inputs, your breath, your, the sounds that you can hear, the feeling of your body on the chair. And every time your mind gets carried off in thought, bringing your attention back to those things. So it's essentially a grounding exercise in your body. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's helped me feel very safe and accepting of bodily sensations as opposed to aversive. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like even like 10 minutes every day, five minutes every day, using an app, using a YouTube video, for me has been extremely beneficial. Just, uh, it creates a distance between yourself and your thoughts. It's a reminder that we're not wedded to our thoughts, we're not fused to our thoughts. I, you can watch the thoughts come and go. And for me, that's been really liberating because I used to think that I made my thoughts, I created them and that they were synonymous with who I am. But when you practice mindfulness long enough, you start to feel further away from them and you watch them. And that's been really powerful. Okay, so but just remember not to use it in an, as, as Rose said earlier, it's not something when you're anxious and in the acute phase, you know, you stick yeah. to the basics otherwise. This okay. is something longer term. Right. 
And so do you do guided meditation then? Or? I do guided, yeah. I would start okay. with guided yeah. meditation. Do, start doing some simple five-minute guided meditations if you want to get into it. And then you can do open awareness, which is what I described, where you're basically sitting and observing your sensations. And has it helped to lower your anxiety or helped your thoughts in any way? Yeah, I mean, twice today. So I did three talks today, um, yeah. and it's always quite overwhelming being surrounded by so many people and public speaking. Like, twice today I've gone to the bathroom and taking 10 deep breaths and notice the sensations of breathing um, and it helps it really really helps it helps physiologically it helps lower your heart rate um, it helps lower the stress hormones going so yeah it's great, great. do it thank you all right we've got to finish now as i said if you do have pedophile intrusive sexual thoughts and you're happy for just to leave me leave your name on an email or something i'd be most grateful if we can just have consent to contact you one day in terms of uh, possible research projects to let you know about them